JC News, St. John Church News. Here's your anchor, Sandra Dorsey. Good morning, St. John family and friends. Welcome to today's edition of SJC News. Once again, we choose to celebrate this new season of fall by preparing to help others during the month of November with our canned food drive. With Thanksgiving taking place in November, we want this food drive to be extra special by blessing others with Thanksgiving baskets. In order to do this, we will need your help preparing the baskets. So please stay tuned this week for details on how you can help. The 6th District AME Mid-Year Convocation will take place this week on Wednesday, October 27th through Friday, October the 29th. Our pastor, Dr. Richard Washington, will be attending. We pray that God will grant him safe travels to and from and for the glory of the Lord to have its way. Prayer is our most crucial conversation on any given day. It's meant to set the tone for the day by inviting God into it. So please join our prayer ministry this week on Monday, October the 25th and Friday, October the 29th for prayer at 7 a.m. That concludes this week's edition of SJC News. Be informed, stay connected, and spread the news. Now here's Donya Albright. Today is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Greetings, St. John family, and welcome to today's virtual worship experience. Please be reminded that members of the finance team will be here today from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. to receive your tithes and offerings. You may also take advantage of use of our cash app. Please be reminded that God loves a cheerful giver. And now let us be blessed with a word from our pastor, Reverend Washington. Good morning and welcome to the very last Sunday of the month of October in the year 2021. Truly God has been good to you, God has been good to me, and God is still in the wide open blessing business. I greet you in the love of God, in the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, and I greet you in the expectation that Jesus will bring you through all things. It's a joy to be with you this morning and to welcome you on this, the Lord's day, not Halloween, but the Lord's day for what the Lord desires to do. I'm excited today because we are coming to a point where we start only two months left in this year. Can you believe that? We roll if the Lord is willing to allow us to come together on next Sunday, we roll into the month of November. This year has gone by and we want you to know that God is still in the blessing business. Please keep in mind the announcements that we shared last week about our partnership with the wonderful sister church of Allen Temple and how we are looking to take a blessing to the people of Benton Harbor, Michigan, helping them bathe, drink, and cook. I need your help. I need your assistance. Come on, let's do something great for God, and let's let people know that God is answering prayers. Let me share with you what your ancestors want you to know. You are the answer to their prayers, and I believe we, with this effort, can be the answer to somebody's prayers for water. Come on and join us. Let's bless God. We are blessed to be a blessing and let's do the work of God. Amen. Listen, let's go to work in the word of God today. Let me invite you to join me in a simple moment of prayer as we prepare to be blessed by the word of God. Gracious God for the blessings we have been enjoying this entire month for how you brought us through all of October to this very 31st day. We give you praise and we give you honor. We want to pause now and invite you into this day. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Lord, let your kingdom come in our life and on this earth as your kingdom is reigning in glory and heaven. Lord, we thank you and we pray that this daily bread will be enough to sufficiently get us through. In Christ Jesus' name we say, amen. 
family, let's go to work. I'm excited today. And I'll be honest, I'm really not preaching to you. I'm really preaching to myself. And if you're just happening to eavesdrop, may the Lord bless you even more. Let's go to work in the gospel. Yes, sir. We're leaving the Old Testament. Can you believe it? We spent a whole month in the book of Genesis just wrestling with things. The Lord has placed on our heart to move to the New Testament, to the first book, which is Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, Matthew's gospel, chapter 25. As we conclude this month and walk toward the end of the year, let me invite you to Matthew chapter 25, and I need you to find your way to verse 14 and verse 15. Hear this word today from the English translation of this Greek New Testament text. Matthew chapter 25, starting at verse 14 and 15. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted them with his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one he gave one, to each according to his ability. Then the master went away. Amen. This morning, having read this powerful word, I draw your attention to this subject matter that ministers to all of us when life deals you an uneven hand. When life deals you an uneven hand. I want you to know that so many lies have come through the lips of humanity, particularly those who have lived over the centuries in the United States of America. We even start in the Constitution with some lies. The truth is we hear these words and we have had to learn them. Well, there's a generation of us that had to learn the words to the Constitution. There's a generation of persons who know by memory the words. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. The reality is that is not the truth. If we're telling the gospel truth, everyone is not created equally. You don't have to agree, but let me just make it live for you. As a pastor who has served as a chaplain in hospice centers and in hospitals, I have walked enough hallways in the hospitals and the hospice centers, in the nursing homes, even in the schools, and yes, in the jail cells, to understand that everybody is not created equal. There are babies who are born with five fingers, five toes, with two ears, a mouth, a nostril, a nose, eyes, and all other elements that work perfectly fine. While in the same hospital, a door down, there are other persons who are parents who have wrestled with a pregnancy for maybe nine months, maybe earlier, to find out that their child has differences than the child that was born in the room next to them. Maybe their child did not come out with two eyes properly. Maybe their mouth has been twisted. Maybe their hands did not completely develop. I want you to know there sometimes what looks normal on the outside can also have challenges on the inside. I'm here to tell you that we are not all created equal. The sad part is that we don't even want to acknowledge that all people are not created equal and all people don't have equality in the world. That's the challenge already, I feel good. That's the tough part about being in America right now. That really is the tough part about being in Brazil. That's the tough part about being in South America, period. It's the tough part about being in England. It's the tough part about being in the mother of all humanity, Africa, to recognize people struggle to admit that everyone is not created equal. The reality is if we have to admit, if we have to understand that people are not created equal, that would suggest that there are some circumstances that require assistance and development when things are not created equal. Oh, face the facts. If you start out the way blacks in America have started out, or you start out losing everything that you know, losing your language, your family, your customs, your culture. If you are starting out shipped in roles, shipped in, it's tough, shipped 
in the struggles and the chains, leaving everything behind you, having to startle, having to learn a language, having people beat you when you don't comprehend. You understand that life is not created equal. I don't want us to come to the conclusion of this year, this 2021, without recognizing not just in America, but across the world that life <clears throat> is not giving us equal opportunities. We can understand that when it comes to understand that how the pandemic has exposed health care, how the pandemic has exposed the challenges that we have to face, not only in health care, but with the wealth disparities in this country and this world. Oh, brothers and sisters, how do we live when life deals us an uneven hand. I don't know about you, but this year has taught me that life will deal you an uneven hand. And, and, and I'll be honest this morning, I, I want you to know that there is one pastime that I love that some of you are, you love it, but you don't want to admit it. I love to play cards. Now I'm not an expert, I, I'm not good at Pinochle, I'm not good at Pequino, I'm not all that wonderful at uh, Gin Rummy, I'm not all that great at some of the other card games, 21 or Tonk, I'm, I'm not that good at poker. Uh, matter of fact, I need to learn how to do it a little bit better. I'm not all that great, but there is one game, one card game that I love to play. I could spend hours with my family, my cousins, my siblings, I could spend hours with people learning and, and enjoying the gift of conversation and life as we dialogue playing one game. And that is everybody, well, not everybody. Most of us who are uh, sun-kissed, most of us who have blackened skin, most of us who have traveled to the collegiate experiences of the historically black institutions known as colleges or universities, most of us who even played or, uh, or, or discovered the opportunities at predominantly white institutions, PWI, hey wit, I want you to know that we all in some way, shape or form have had an opportunity to play this game that I love. Everybody knows it. It is what I call the universal game of the holidays, spades. Oh yes, if you have gone to FAMU, if you've gone to Southern, if you've gone to Fort Valley State, let me say it right, the Fort Valley State, if you've gone to Jackson State, if you have been through Clark Atlanta University, if you ever spent any time on the campus of the Interdenominational Theological Center, the ITC, if you've been through Morris Brown College, if you've been to Moore House, if you come through Spelman, if you come through Savannah State, if you come through, well, that school in Albany, I'm not even going to call its name, just that school down there. Yes, yes. If you've come through any of those institutions, if you come through the greatest institution in the state of Georgia, collegiately, the University of West Georgia, if you've come through any of those institutions, you understand the power of a spade game. If you've been through the Georgia Southern, if you've come through any institution of higher learning where you have sat closely at the tables in the student centers, in the apartments, you understand how spades is a national pastime. It can teach you so much about your roommates. It can teach you so much about the intricacies of relationships, spades. I, I love to play it. And one thing I discovered about playing spades, Prudence, one thing I've discovered about playing spades, Juanita, one thing I've discovered, Sarita, about playing spades, hear me, is every now and then you will get a hand that is uneven. Every now and then the dealer will cut the cards, if you will. Girl, and every now and then they'll cut the cards and give you a hand that looks nothing like you need or desire. It's an uneven hand. And one of the things in trying to teach younger people, one of the things in trying to teach my own son how to play this game called spades is no matter what hand you have, you've got to play it even when it's uneven. Someone in here understands that if you can hand or handle the hand you've been dealt, if you can handle it without throwing it in, if you can handle it and work with what you have, sometimes what you thought was a bad hand can end up being the best hand. If, if I have any real spade player listening at me, if I have anybody, Clay, listening to me who knows how to play spades, if I have anyone listening to me or watching this morning, you, you may have to testify that every now and then the hand you thought 
was not a good hand ended up being a hand that you almost ran a Boston. You almost cleaned the table because you played the hand you were dealt even when it was uneven. Hello, somebody. Life will deal us uneven hands. What do we do in the year 2021 as it comes to a close when we are looking at our life this year? How do we move forward into possibly a new beginning with the reality that 2021 has not dealt us with an, uh, with an even hand? How have you made it this year through many dangers? Toils and snares, we have already come. Carrie, how have we made it with an uneven hand? There, there's some University of Georgia fans here. There, there's some Bulldog fans here who got to testify that this year hadn't always dealt us an even hand, but we have stayed with them. And we're ranked number one. Hello, brother Luke, ranked number one. No roll tide here. Yeah, it's go dogs. Listen, the text testifies. It's a great way to learn a lesson as we come to the close of 2021. I feel good today. It's a great day to examine when life deals us uneven hands. What do we do? How does the gospel of Matthew in chapter 25 help us when life deals us uneven hands? I'm glad you want to know. I'm glad I desire to know. I'm glad the Lord has eased this particular passage of scripture in our view because there's meat here. There's some roast here. There's some good food spiritual to eat in this text. I want you to recognize that the text unfolds with Jesus talking to people, trying to explain to them the entire chapter. Our Lord and leader and savior, Jesus, is attempting to help people understand one reality, what the kingdom of God is all about. He's trying to teach us. He's trying to share a word of truth with us so that we can comprehend what the kingdom of God is going to be like. Oh, wait a minute. Rewind. Put the pen in it. Let me walk hermeneutically around, not with the kickstand, but with the car put in park and the emergency brake lifted. Come here. Jesus is trying to show us what the kingdom of God is like and the reality is he tells us a parable where there is uneven hands that have been dealt. Life has dealt the three brothers in the text. Uneven hands. Wait a minute. Is the kingdom of God really like that? I, I hope you can see that God and life have not promised even hands. Jesus starts out saying it's like this. And wait, wait, before we go any further, that ought to trouble you. That ought to make you tremble, not with fear, but with expectation. If God has dealt us uneven hands in life, what does that suggest about the reality of God's power? It suggests that God doesn't need us to have even hands in order to bless us. I ain't trying to preach that. I just thought I'd drop that in your spirit before you get all cantankerous and turn me off. God doesn't need our hands to be even in order to bless and push us forward. Whoo, hello, Jesus, coming on back in here. Jesus says the kingdom of God is like this. He hit us with one and said, it's like 10 virgins. Then he says, if you can't get with that because you are offended with the terminology that he's using, Jesus comes back, help me Holy Spirit, and says it's like a, a master, a leader who owns property and decides that he wants to go on a trip a vacation of sorts. And so he calls three servants of his and says to them, I'm giving you something, a talent, we've heard it. And we know that talent is relegated to money, but sometimes we have to think beyond what the scriptures are revealing on the surface. Talents cannot just, or just not going to refer to money. Family, talents are also referring to gifts, abilities. That's what the Greek word talent exposes. It's just not about economic stability. It's about our ability 
what God has entrusted in our hands. The word says that Jesus tells us, Jesus tells us that he gave one five. He gave another two. And then he gave one brother just one. But the scripture says according to their ability. And then the scripture tells us he walks away. I, I, you can read the rest of it for yourself. But I really wanted you to focus in on the setup which is what they had. They are dealt uneven hands. Listen, this brother in the text who has five is all right. The brother who says, I don't have five, but at least I've got two. He feels good. But that brother with the one, that, that, that brother, that person with one talent is where the, 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 the meat of the story comes. I don't know about you, but I wasn't necessarily given five. I wasn't necessarily given two. Maybe, maybe I was given one. And maybe you identified. That's what I love about God. God throws messages out and helps you to identify with someone in the text. Who are you? Do you have five? Do you have two? Or do you have one? When life deals us uneven hands. What should we do? Let me cut across the field. This is good to me, but I ain't going to be here all day. Let me cut across the field early, Karen. Let me cut across here like Justin Fields would do. Let me cut across this field and throw this to you and you walk into the end zone. When life deals you an uneven hand, please understand you are not alone. I need you to be clear. You are not the Lone Ranger. You are not the only person in the history of humanity who's had to deal with uneven hands. Matter of fact, can I tell you this? Jesus himself has to deal with an uneven hand. He was not born in the palace. He was born in the urban setting called a ghetto. He was born in an outhouse where there were stinky animals surrounding him. We're going to celebrate. Isn't it crazy? Isn't it strange that in another month or so, in the month of December, humanity as culture will begin to celebrate that the Savior of the world was born in the ghettos of a place called Bethlehem? Isn't it strange that the outhouse where stinky animals resided is where we're going to throw up holy hands and give God praise? Because when the world would not open its arms to him, a stall opened its cradle. And let me share with you, that's how God will bless you. God did need him to be born in the palaces of Jerusalem. God needed him to be born in the ghettos of Bethlehem so he would include people like us. Text says everybody didn't have an equal hand in this parable. Jesus identifies with the man who doesn't have what others have. He was born in the ghetto. He was raised with the father, but get this, who uniquely had to struggle, try to make it, and then died early. Jesus has to help the family stay together by working as a carpenter, trying to help, help the family make their ends meet. Hello, somebody. Everybody has been there before. When life has stripped you of what you thought made you equal. I have family. I have friends who have lost loved ones. I have friends who have tried to grapple with the realities of loss through death with spouses. I've had family members, I have family members who really don't understand why God would do what God has done, why life would take away from them the people they love and they cherish. I know enough about the hospitals and the cancer centers and the hospice uh, centers and, and high schools and elementary schools and, and also colleges and technical schools. I know enough about them to understand that there are people in the hallways who can testify that life has not been fair. What do you do? One got five, one got two, three. One has just one. When life deals us an alien with hand, I need for us to do this number one thing. You've got to first acknowledge and accept that life is not fair. I need you to understand that. 
Let me clear this up to everyone. Life is not going to be fair. And that's the biggest lie that America has yet to own up to. Life in the United States is not fair. Black children going to school don't receive the same treatment as others. It ain't fair. You who work hard, you who have lived and done the right things in your life can testify that doing the right thing does not always equal the right outcome. Some of you have been to church consistently, even virtually. Some of you have tithed and have studied the word and have followed the prescriptions of the word to be blessed, but life still took your job. Life still gave you a desert to live in. Life still has broken your heart. People still have abused and misused and lied on you. You never told a lie on anybody, but people have put their mouths on you. People have broken you and tried to kill you life is not fair and you've got to acknowledge that reality I hope that America would love I would love for America to acknowledge the truth that it is not fair that living in America is not fair that living in Brazil is not fair that living in this place called home or that we call home on the native land is not fair Life is not fair. Stop telling our children that. Stop telling them that if they get an education, that if they have good credit, stop telling them that if they obey the laws of the police and the system of justice in America, that they will never have to worry. Tell them the truth. Maybe that's what's wrong. I know for myself because I've talked with atheists. I've talked with people who have been Christian but have walked away from the church. I've talked with those who used to be AMEs. And the reality is everyone says this truth. Life dealt us uneven hands. And the religious entities refuse to acknowledge that. What, what would life be like? How would religion and relationship work? If the church of the living God told the truth and said, life ain't fair. Langston Hughes said it best, life for me ain't been no crystal stair. Listen, the poets across the history have tried to testify that life is not fair in poetry. David said it too. Why do the heathen rage? Life is not fair. And if we can acknowledge that reality, you're going to feel better. I, I know it will bring relief to your psyche. I know it would bring relief to your emotional state if you would accept the reality that life is not fair. Uneven hands are a part of life, but you got to play the hand that you dealt. And if you play it well, if you hold on to it, if you weather the storm, if you hang in there, I've come to tell you things can change with your hand. This man that we are centering on was dealt an uneven hand. Text says that the guy who had five went on about his business. The next fellow went on about his business and both of them used what they had because they had more. Have you ever thought about that reality? That the re see we want to be so holy, so pious and panache that we don't want to accept the realities that those other brothers who had more than the man with one actually went away and did what they did because they had something that somebody else didn't. Hello, you know, it's tough when you ain't got nothing to do something. <laughs> but these brothers who had more than this one brother had were able to do because they had something. Let me help you in America. You can do more white Americans because you have had more. Hello. You can do more because you were not stripped with everything. Let me share this word. We are not complaining. I'm trying to tell you to look at the text and see. The reality is they did more because they had more. When you have more, 
Whether you use it for the glory of God or not, you do more. Hello, this brother who doesn't have what others have, he failed to acknowledge that life was not giving him an even hand. He failed, he, he didn't acknowledge it. And because he doesn't acknowledge that, here's the reality, he throws a pity party. Text says that while they went off and worked and did what they could, he went and sat and buried his. He, he threw a pity party. Let me help you understand, God does not join pity parties. The God I serve, the God I've come to know doesn't show up at our pity parties. Matter of fact, the only people that show up at our pity parties are those who are just like us, looking for an answer, trying to wrestle with the realities that life has dealt with us. God is not at your pity party. Why? Because if you think that God is limited to what you have in your hands. You have misinterpreted God. That's, that's what I want people to know who've walked away from the church. That's what I want people to know who said that God can't fix it, who said that God doesn't have the strength to do it. What I want you to understand is this reality, acknowledging that life deals you uneven hands does not limit our God. God is not at the pity party. God is not a head hanger. God is a head lifter. The scripture says, lift up ye heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted, ye everlasting doors, that the king of glory might come in. God likes to show up at good parties. Anybody been to a bad party? Anybody been to a bad house party where you stayed three minutes and then had to ease up out of there? Anybody been to a showing where the party was not what it should have been. This, this is a throwback to my mama and to my sisters and to my friend Ian Spencer. This is a throwback. Anybody went to a party and said, well, the party over. Who gonna take you home? Look, look, the party was horrible because it was pitiful. This man threw a pity party and God was not there. God doesn't show up at pity parties, so stop throwing them. Somebody said to me they were feeling pretty bad one day. They said, I prayed and, 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 and I didn't hear nothing from God. How did you pray? When you have pity parties, it's an indicator that your prayers are pitiful in the pits. Doesn't mean you can't pray in a pit. It just means your perspective is not what it should be. Scripture again says, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted, ye everlasting doors. Let me cut across the field. I'm having fun with this. You got to acknowledge that life is not fair. When you acknowledge that life is not fair, the, the second thing I need you to understand that this brother didn't get, he, he had a pity party and God didn't show up. But one other thing will happen or should happen when life deals us uneven hands, we cannot be resigned to the hand we have been dealt, the condition. Just because you got an uneven hand doesn't mean it's gonna stay that way. I might be in a tough spot today, but honey, I ain't gonna be in this tough spot forever. That, that's why I love the story of black people in America and brown people across the continent of, the, of Africa and brown people across this world. There is something innate within us that says we are this way today, but tonight it might be a different story. There's somebody who knows that you don't have to accept the conditions that you're in. You ain't got to be resigned to it. The condition can change. He didn't do it. He stayed in it. He gave up because that's all he saw was what he had. Maybe that's why God has put you in the position that you're in. Maybe that's why God has put us in certain circumstance so that we can recognize that we aren't able to do anything. We've got to wait on God. You know, God won't open doors for jobs just because you have resigned that if it doesn't happen through your ability, it can't happen. You know something? I don't know if you recognize this, but I've read scripture a long time. I've studied the word. I've went to school to learn how to study the word. 
And one thing I have looked for, and I, I, I ain't ashamed to say it, but you might not recognize it. Maybe you don't want to say it. I'll say it. The one thing I know about this is that God never said he would be fair. And I've also recognized that Jesus never spent time dealing with life being fair. In any of the stories that you read about the Lord our Savior Jesus Christ in Scripture, he never wastes time trying to explain why things were the way they were. That, that's because that's not his job. That was above his pay grade on earth. He couldn't spend time trying to tell people about why the predicament was the way it was. What he did was help people realize that because the conditions are the way they are does not mean that it's going to stay that way. You've got to have something, he said, faith the size of mustard seeds and say to the circumstances, move and it would be moved. Jesus never spent time trying to explain why life is the way it is. He just dealt with the reality that you can't stay resigned to it. You can't believe that your life is resigned to the conditions that you're in and I'm come to tell you that right now no matter the condition your life is in right now no matter how difficult it is or how good it is you can be in a palace right now but it will not stay that way you can be in a pit right now but it will not stay that way Jesus tells us be of good cheer I have already overcome it you've got to have faith to give you the capacity to move forward when life deals you an uneven hand, first acknowledge that it's uneven, it's not fair. Secondly, do not be resigned to the condition you find yourself in. You might have cancer. I thank God for my Aunt Kathy who said, listen, get it together, Richard. I need you to pray me through this, but I need you to understand something, Richard. I've got cancer. Cancer does not have me. And that's something I need for you to understand. You may be wrestling with something as tough and tragic as cancer. But I've come to tell you, you cannot give in to the reality. You have cancer. It does not have you. Hold on, Kim. You cannot allow the circumstances that you are in now to end your hope and belief that it's going to get any better. You remember the story of Amistad where those, sir, those Africans were crossing and they took over a, a ship and ended up in court and, and one of the former presidents of the United States argued their case and won for them. Do you know how that came about? because they were not going to be resigned to the condition of slavery. They were on a boat in the middle of nowhere, but decided we were not gonna be resigned to being slaves. Come here for a minute. They said, we are free and you got to give us what we were when you came and stole us. Sometimes the shifting in our circumstances don't start with the door open, it starts with the mindset that I am more than where I am. And that's what I wanna strengthen you with. I want you to know that right now you are more than the conditions that you're in. If this brother in the text had recognized that it didn't matter what he had, what mattered was what he could do with it. I've come to tell you that we are not all equally intellectually the same. Everybody has different intellectual abilities. Everybody has different emotional ranges. Everybody has different social skills. But no matter what our skill level is, we cannot be resigned to the skills that we have. We've got to know that I can improve, I can grow, I can change, I can become. I've just got to give a little interest and I've got to work hard. I've got to use what I have. Come here for a minute. You don't have to be six foot nine to be in the NBA. You don't have to have college degrees, an MBA, a law degree, or a PhD to own your own business. You don't need that. Honey, there are some people 
who have been more successful as business owners and have not been through a day of the Kellogg Business School. They have never been to Harvard, they've never been to Princeton, they've never been to Yale, they've never been to the University of Georgia. But honey, they can manage and have been successful because they have used the one talent that they've had. I've got to go, I'm serious. It's late in the fourth quarter and I got to go, but this is good to me. I pray it is blessing you. I want you to understand this reality. When you acknowledge that life is not fair, when you are not resigned to the conditions you find yourself in, you can handle the last thing that was messed up. The brother with one talent buried his and set and decided he was going to cuss the master out because of what the master did not give him. This leads into my final point. I, I made it live because I wanted you to get ready for the final point. This shouts me, it ought to encourage you when life has dealt you an uneven hand. Acknowledge, don't be resigned, but also remember you got something. The text testifies that everybody got something. Everybody had a talent. Didn't matter how much or how many they had. Everybody got something. Come here for a minute. God never said, I'll be fair. But I can promise you in the life that I have lived and have seen others live who love God, I have been resigned to this reality. That God may not be fair, but God is good. God will bless you when you don't want to be blessed. God will strengthen you when you'd rather stay weak. God would give when you'd rather not take. God may not be fair, but God is good. In essence, you don't have to have what everybody else has in order to do something. Hear me, somebody. Today, when life gives you an uneven hand, when life deals you a hand in this season that is unfair and uneven, just remember that our God is still good. Why? Because God has each given us something. Our God didn't leave you without. He gave you something to work with. And that's really all God asks us in this world to have. To work with what you got. You may not have what somebody else has. You may not have a house with five bedrooms. You might have an apartment with two, but guess what? It's a roof over your head and it keeps you warm in the midnight hours. You may not have what others have, but you got something. When life gives you an uneven hand, just remember it ain't over, but I've got to use what I've got. Is there anybody in here today that can testify that life has not been fair to you. Life has not given you what you felt you deserved. But life doesn't end because of that. Life goes on because God has given you something. Can I tell you what God has given us? When God is not fair in your life and in mine, God has given us one thing. He's given us a name. How many know what that name is? He's given us a name when you're weak and you're wearied. He's given you a name when your health fails you. He's given you a name. When your money is funny, he's given you a name. When your children are acting strange, he's given you a name. When family abandons you, he's given you a name. And that one name can fix it all. He's given you a name. What's his name? His name is counselor. His name is savior. His name is wonderful. His name is Jesus his name I've called it when I've been in an accident I've called it when I've been heartbroken I've called it when I hadn't had food on a table I've called it when I didn't understand and by calling the name of Jesus things have changed he's given you one thing he's given you a name and he said if you call on the name things will change. I know it sounds strange, 
but there are too many people I love who called on his name and it worked out for them. There are too many people that have trusted in the name that God has given us and the world has been turned around for them. No, it won't happen overnight, but calling on the name we have been given by God is the beginning of making a difference. God bless you. God keep you. As my father would say, this is my prayer. I love you and we'll see you at the first of November. Be encouraged.